As I'm going to begin now, uh, my name is Sean Green. I am the uh, current student senator, the new appointed student senate president. Um, I want to welcome everyone for uh, attending and participating in this. Um, you know, Mass and college leaders, student life. Uh, leaders, uh, especially Dr. Daniels and uh, several of the other uh, president cabinet members. Um, you know, this is a special meeting for us uh, as it is the first uh, summer meeting, uh, the first meeting for the Senate uh, this year. I mean, it also is an important meeting as well because this is uh, where we're going to be able to ask the college leaders uh, and discuss with them important information regarding the current planning and future scenarios for the facilities, academics, and student services. Um, here's a kind of a list of who will be presenting. Uh, Dr. Jack Daniels, the Mass and College President, Dr. Howard Spearman, Vice President of Student Affairs, Dr. Tarina Bakken, the Provost, and Dr. Tim Casper, Vice President of Institutional Learning and Effectiveness. Um, I would uh, say that while they are presenting, I encourage uh, everyone to feel free to add questions in the chat. Uh, there are uh, also well, there is students joining us by phone, and they will also have that opportunity to ask questions after the planned remarks. I will ask that the uh, questions, in, I will ask these questions in the order uh, in which they come into the chat, but we'll skip any questions that have already kind of been answered and are not really gener generally applicable to all students. Uh, uh, there were questions that were submitted ahead of this meeting, which I will be asking as well. Uh, we will make sure that any questions asked that are a, to a specific group of students will be addressed after the meeting. I would like to let everyone know that this meeting is being recorded and will be available for students to access on the Student Senate stream channel. After the conclusion of the Q&A, the Senate will have our general assembly meeting, which any uh, anyone is welcome to uh, attend and stay for. Now that everyone is aware of kind of what uh, tonight's meeting, uh, the plan for the meeting, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Ganiers, president of Madison College. Sean, thank you. Good afternoon, all, and uh, welcome to the Student Lead Leader Forum. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us to listen to you, but also know what we have been doing in terms of our planning processes. You know, since March 15th, we have been right in the middle of this pandemic and the planning of it and how we're going to be moving forward and you're going to hear from Tarina you'll hear from uh, Tim as well as from Howard as those plans are becoming much more uh, moving from concept to actually something that's going to be done concreteness um, and we've got a lot more planning to do part of the issue also with the planning is is that Things change rapidly and all the time. And it's difficult to plan when those changes are actually coming. Uh, we had a change here in Madison and Dane County this past week, Tuesday to be exact, uh, when in fact we went to phase one of the plan of action in terms of reopening. What does that mean for us? Uh, we've had to sit down and really think through those types of processes. And so the planning, and I, and I will tell you about the planning, that we continue to be number one in terms of what is the health and safety that we've got to be able to be considerate of. Those are for students, our faculty, and our staff. And I think number two is how, in fact, do we provide for the students excellent instruction over this period of time, as well as services. We also know that we'll never return to pre-March 15th. <laughs> so what is that plan gonna look like, not just for the fall, moving to the spring of next year and beyond? And hopefully this will start that dialogue where we can have further discussion on what those plans are, but also listen to your input on that as well. So right now I'm gonna turn it over to Tim, uh, who is going to give us uh, cursory, brief cursory remarks regarding the scenarios. Tim? You're muted. Ah, there we go. Thank you, Dr. Daniels and uh, members of the Senate. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you. I'm going to share up on my screen um, right now. 
a presentation um, that we shared um, with the college community in late April. And so as Dr. Daniels just stated, um, we've been spending a lot of time planning for the future, recognizing that that future is going to be much more uncertain than any planning scenario the college has thought through in probably its 100 year history. Um, and the difficulty, of course, is really posed by the public health situation. So with that, um, I'm going to step into this abbreviated version of our thinking as a college um, related to um, preparing for uh, your education and the education of your fellow students um, in the subsequent fall. Um, so I'll cover this and then Dr. Bakken will talk more specifically about ac academic planning uh, for the fall semester, followed by Dr. Spearman to speak about student services in the fall semester. And then we'll do the Q&A that President Green will facilitate. Um, so why do we take this scenario planning on? Uh, well, it was really about planning as a college. Um, when we talk about this being a time of great uncertainty, each one of us as executive leaders of the college, along with the different deans and managers and faculty and staff members of the college, might have all had a different idea of what an uncertain future could look like. So what we did as a cabinet was we created three different possible uncertain futures. None of them are going to be true. None of them are going to be what actually happens to us. But we wanted to be able to shape our thinking by focusing on three possible things that could occur to the to our students, to the communities that we serve. And so what I'm going to review with you next is sort of a high level overview of what we considered. And then we're going to apply those considerations to three different scenarios. And those scenarios are really sort of framed as the economic conditions that we might see in South Central Wisconsin over the next roughly 18 months. Um, and those economic conditions we've framed up as a rapid recovery, as represented by a racehorse, a sort of slow and uneven recovery, as represented by a turtle family, and finally, an economic depression uh, represented by a polar bear. Considered here, um, we looked at, you know, what might social distancing practice look like um, at different times, given different sets of public health conditions, um, that we might experience in the future. Um, we made some assumptions about what different decisions policymakers might be making both in Washington, D.C., as well as here in Madison, so that we could understand what we might have to be prepared for given the decisions that they make or don't make. We also wanted to consider tax revenues. As a public institution, uh, your tuition dollars support just a quarter of our overall operating budget. The other 75% comes from either local property taxpayers or the state of Wisconsin. So what those tax revenues look like is very impactful to our ability to meet our mission. And then finally, we made some assumptions about, you know, what jobs and industry areas um, might, you know, come back more strongly in any of these different uh, scenarios that we thought about and which ones might not come back very strongly given the different uh, both economic conditions as well as the public health conditions. And then we thought about at a very high level again, what that might mean for enrollment, for our academic programs, for the way we deliver student services, what it generally means for our faculty, staff, and administrators, and finally, what it means for the college's finances. And so again, as we think about these scenarios, we're thinking about different levels of severity, starting with that racehorse, um, which is the least severe set of uh, assumptions, followed by the turtle family and the polar bear family. We understand that what we predict might happen in any one scenario might actually occur in another phase right, of severity so that there's not a linearness, even though it's represented linearly here, to what might happen to us as a college. So again, in this first uh, scenario, we talked about a racehorse economy, right? That our public health conditions stabilized quickly uh, by this period of late spring, early summer, that social distancing practices begin to get relaxed, and that many of the economic sectors come back strong, right? Just like a race, almost all those horses cross that finish line. And we were thinking about what that type of scenario might mean for the college. We assumed that our enrollments and our finances are sort of minimally impacted. Um, we know we continue to offer online programming uh, because that's even in uh, a public health situation that is a little better than it was back in February and March. 
Um, and we think about, again, being intentional about how do we provide technology access to you as students, as well as our employees. And so we did some work this spring um, to get through the spring semester, but I want you to know that we're already thinking about um, how do we do this for the fall and spring semesters of next year? And there's a group of leaders from the technology services department, from the faculty, from student affairs, from the budget office, thinking through how might we make sure that students have the technology that they need to access remote learning in the future. Uh, the next set of economic conditions that we thought about were more like a turtle family. So turtles, once they have those eggs, the mom and dad turtle, they quickly leave the scene, right? And some turtles succumb to predators, some before even they leave that egg, right? So some things just don't survive. Um, of the turtles that do survive the very young stage, some of them begin to have families of their own much more quickly, right? Representing perhaps areas of the economy that might experience faster growth. Um, other turtles are much less quick to begin their own families. And so that might represent areas of the economy that might not come back nearly as quickly. Um, so in this sort of area where we've got this lumpiness to the economy, what might that mean for us? And we can imagine where we'll see some of the right industries that are slow to come back, most notably the service industry, right? Restaurants, hotels, conventions, uh, those types of things are not gonna come back in a situation where the public health uh, has not greatly improved. And when we thought about, you know, this slowness and unevenness to the economy, um, perhaps there were other areas of the economy that might not be doing as well. You know, you might not see construction workers, those empl employed in the trades, um, doing as well as they had been prior to March of this year, because business is pulling back from some of its investments as it looks at its uh, ability to make revenue in the future and their conservativeness, right, leads to job losses in other areas outside of the tourism and hospitality industry. So when we think about how this might impact a college, right, we think about that our college enrollments and our finances are, are impacted more, right? There's fewer tax revenues that are generated here in the state of Wisconsin. The federal government is much slower to respond by providing funds directly to states and local governments, including technical colleges, right? And so that hurts our ability to, to meet our mission. Um, and thinking about this situation, right, our academic program focus becomes on even more offerings for you as students that are acceler accelerated, excuse me, so you could get into the workforce more quickly with a credential that is meaningful to employers and that our offerings are flexible, right? How do we meet you where you're at given the, given the health situation? Um, when we thought about this scenario again, it's an economy that's weaker. Um, we see that Wi-Fi access, right, becomes more difficult, right? As families, as they look to their budgets, right, as more people are negatively affected by the economic downturn, uh, they may have a difficult time maintaining that high-speed internet access, right? They may find themselves only able to use um, smaller data plans on their phones, and that's not as robust, of course, a service as you're aware. So those are some things we're thinking about when we're thinking about this sort of uh, middle type of recovery represented by the turtle family. And finally, um, the final scenario we thought through was, you know, the sort of economic depression, right? So a polar bear itself is a big, strong, powerful animal, but their survival, right, is really based on a very complex ecosystem, right? And there's a lot of interventions that need to go into place to support polar bear population. Well, as we think about an economy that's in a severely depressed state, right, there's a lot of um, economic policy that has to be set primarily at the federal level to quell and mitigate against a really deep uh, economic depression. And so in thinking through this scenario, right, we were making assumptions that perhaps policymakers, again, primarily in Washington, aren't able to come to agreement on certain issues, right, that would perhaps help state and local governments meet their obligations to fund their services. Um, we saw that they weren't going to invest maybe in things like job training programs that we would have expected them to do in some of the previous scenarios. Um, so in this case, right, the impacts to the college are even more severe than the prior two scenarios, right? Our finances are more severely impacted. Um, our college enrollments are more severely impacted, in part because the overall economy, right, looks weaker. So if in the previous scenarios, the hospitality and tourism industry and aspects of uh, construction trades were impacted, we begin to see more areas. may have been viewed themselves as middle class and already had a degree from our college or a four-year institution, right? They begin to find their households 
uh, interrupt it and, and they're not able to be employed at the level they were back in March. And so due to all of that, right, we know that we've got to focus our academic offerings on those areas that are truly um, viable in this type of an economy. And we really thought about, you know, some of the health service occupations continuing to be areas of growth, um, areas such as uh, police and fire service uh, continuing to be areas of growth. Um, and some of our manufacturing areas, particularly related to food and food security being areas uh, where we might see employment opportunities. And then finally, and perhaps most obviously, information technology jobs, right, continue to be an area where people can seek employment and, and obtain jobs. Um, but as we think about how people access the education in a, an environment where, again, the public health situation is pretty severe um, and family budgets have gotten more constrained and private providers who've been offering, you know, high speed Internet access to, to students and the families and they pull back on that. Well, then how do we how do we work to address these technology air concerns for many, many more families? Right. And that's. Uh, issue that you know we as a college might not be solely able to address, but how do we partner with um, other entities, K-12 school districts, area economic development corporations, et cetera, that are thinking about the same issue that relates to the populations that they serve. So in conclusion, we know that all these scenarios that we just covered with you are going to differ from the reality of what actually comes true. And already we've learned more about these scenarios in the seven or eight weeks that they've been out there since we started thinking about them because of changes with Dr. Daniels reference to public policy because of changes to the health situation. They're just here to help us guide our planning, which my colleagues, Drs. Bakken and Spearman will speak to in a little more detail uh, shortly here and provide us with this sort of common framework as a college community uh, to have an understanding of the, the breadth of different things that might face us as a college prepare us to move forward. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, um, Dr. Bakken. All right, Tim, thank you very much. Uh, well, good evening, everybody, students, uh, President King, it's, it's great to see you in that role, Dr. Daniels, and uh, all my colleagues that are out there. Um, you know, of so many inspiring stories that of our students, I heard another one yesterday um, and I'd like to open my, my comments, and I, I wrote a few comments down, but I'm always happy to answer all of your individual questions as well. But I wanted to open my comments by sharing a, this story. Um, Mackenzie, uh, one of our spring graduates in surgical, started her new career this week with SSM Health and St. Clair Hospital up in Baraboo. Since she missed the formal graduation, her new employer, who was a great partner at Madison College, sent us smiling photos and a note that read, quote, we greeted her on day one with her own personal graduation ceremony at morning huddle, including music, gown, cap, diploma, and a cheering crowd as we welcomed her into our family, unquote. Um, you know, and this is hopefully um, the most disruptive, unsettling time that any of us will ever face. Um, but through it all, and when I say all, I mean the last 12 weeks, which means, which feels like a lifetime, uh, we have continued uh, to experience the best of this college and the very best of our students. And nothing, despite the uncertainty, can stop the stories like Mackenzie's uh, from continuing for all of you, nothing. Um, this spring, we have persevered through immense academic change and challenges. Some of it worked out great. Some of it did not work out great. Uh, and like our faculty, many of our students were thrown into a way of learning that they didn't want and that they didn't like, uh, made more difficult by just the life challenges uh, that we're all facing um, due to COVID-19. But you stuck it out, trusted our faculty, leaned on student services, and to begin today, I just want to assure you, uh, and you heard this from Dr. Daniels, from Tim, you'll hear it after me. Um, and we want to promise you that no matter what the coming uncertain days and weeks bring to, to all of us, um, those of us on this call, our faculty, our staff, uh, we continue to be driven every day by doing what we have to do in order to do right by U.S. students uh, in your future. Now, as we emerge from this immediate crisis of spring, which I just want to remind you because it's awesome, 92% of our spring courses uh, finished on time on May 15th. Uh, only 2% were canceled. 
And most of the rest of our courses are finishing right now with strict protocols in place. And I'm hearing really smooth operations, thanks to a lot of people about those uh, finish, getting finished. We turn our attention now to summer and then decisions about fall. Now, it seems that that would be kind of a linear progression, but in reality, it's all happening at the same time. <laughs> um, for 20 years, Madison College has been a leader in online instruction, but we've also stood firm for over a century on the traditions of face-to-face -face learning. And I know that many students and faculty are hoping, praying, begging, wishing uh, to get back to all in-person classes as soon as possible. Um, but as you know, and, and Tim overviewed, and uh, Dr. Daniels mentioned in our opening, we are in an incredibly fluid situation with a great deal of uncertainty, and we will always put the health and safety of our faculty and staff and students first. So let me mention just something real quick about summer and I'll move into fall. Uh, summer is almost exclusively online. We're offering over 440 credit courses. We have about 10% that we're still finessing that will require some face-to-face -face completion effort. Uh, we're also monitoring waiting lists, uh, closely monitoring waiting lists and adding sections as we need to, to accommodate more students. Um, in terms of fall, Planning and adjustments are advancing now and very rapidly. All schools are being guided by a plan that focuses on being as flexible as possible via online, remote course attendance, and agile labs. In short, anything that can be delivered remotely via online or online live, flexibility will be built in up front for all of our critical face-to-face -face offerings. Uh, with contingency plans in place for all of our courses should conditions in the fall change and require a move back to all remote options. We certainly are hoping that won't happen, but we will be prepared if it does. And just quickly to tie into Tim's comments, on the academic uh, side, we continue to monitor labor market data and trends to determine which industries and jobs will rebound the quickest and will be in highest demand, including healthcare, nursing, medical lab tech, respiratory therapy, protective services, information technology, human services, and digital design, including web and social media. And we're continuing to advance our transfer options, especially looking to serve university students who may not return to their university this fall, but who would be well served by coming and joining us. What you won't see this fall is a full return to all in-person instruction or programming. We are following scheduling strategies to try and minimize class cancellations uh, in order to minim minimize disruption to students. Uh, work is also happening now, and this was a question several of you had, to refine and clarify the delivery mode options so that you know what to expect and make the right choice in your course sele selection that fits you the best. We have targeted a date no later than mid-July to finalize the nearly 3,000 fall credit offerings, many of which are or have already been adjusted to an online or remote delivery mode. Uh, I asked the deans today on a call, do you think I can give that date? And they were confident in the date and said, we can do it before that. Uh, we're heavily investing also this summer in many creative strategies to improve online course quality and engagement and overall improve your experience uh, in remote courses. A few examples include the creation of an online course or coach kind of TA type position, faculty development, a secure testing process, and much more. All in all, we are trying to balance your need to know what to expect with the need to thoughtfully redesign and strengthen academic quality with the sheer complexity of this new reality. We will continue to provide updates from schools, from faculty, with as much information and detail as possible as the changes become reality. In closing and in summary, it won't be a normal academic semester next fall, likely next spring. In fact, like you, I don't even know what normal means anymore. But as we move through this crisis, the level and speed of change and innovation are astounding, no more so than at Madison College. Ideas, 
that were once unthinkable are now a daily or even an hourly occurrence. Um, I think this is our time um, academically and holistically to move our college beyond back to normal. We have a really rare opportunity to seed the future with better ideas to move this college to a future that works for more students. So with your commitment and input, we will stick together and get this done. You, your peers, and our future students are counting on that. Thank you all, and I will pass it over to the one and only Dr. Howard Spearman. Thank you, Dr. Bakker. So good evening, student senate and student leaders. I truly appreciate that you took the time out of your schedules to have this discussion with us. And uh, tonight, I just I simply plan to provide you with uh, some high level overview or a high level overview of some of the interventions that were developed and implemented during this coronavirus pandemic. Let me also reiterate these interventions are about leading with your safety and success in mind. Additionally, I'm thankful to the passionate student affairs professionals that helped us change direction while trying not to slow down the pace at which we provide you as students with quality services and overall engagement. Please also keep in mind that, like you, the majority of the team was learning what it meant to be a professional in a remote learning environment. And many of them were adjusting to uh, a new definition of work-life balance. Next, I will share some of the interventions that were developed and implemented to help you as students during these difficult times, starting with the fact that student affairs remained accessible to the students through email, website, and within two weeks of making the announcement of building closures, we were accessible by telephones as well. Of course, that would not have been possible without the hard work of IT. So we're thankful to them as well. We also reached out to students through direct mailers and conducted two calling campaigns for over uh, 13,000 students. Professionals from all over the institution were calling students simply to learn your need, to get a better understanding of where you're at in this process and to let you know that we are open. Uh, those calls helped us to identify students that needed laptops and hotspots additional assistance with their uh, remote learning. In April, we also wrote grants in partnership with the grants office for student support funds. We received federal CARES funds to support students during this pandemic. Based on Friday, May 23rd, 1,132 students applied for federal and private CARES funding. The approval process is ongoing. Currently, 673 students have been funded for a total of $540,348. Our goal is, uh, is truly to help you successfully complete the semester. However, we also kept your overall situation in mind as we implemented various interventions. For instance, Students had an opportunity to submit tuition refund under special circumstances appeal, which was approved by our board of trustees. As of May 21st, 232 COVID related appeals were received. 191 appeals were processed totaling $144,000, $144,540, excuse me. Additionally, we eliminated or suspended, I should say, the Standards of Academic Progress, also known as SAP or SAP for spring semester. We also modified the financial aid SAP. Uh, early in late April, Drs. Vila Cruz and Alfred presented those changes to the Senate. Another critical change was the college providing students with a credit, no credit option for spring and summer terms, which UW-Madison also agreed to accept our credit, no credit option as transfer credits. 
We heard you and we, we believe we responded to your concerns. In collaboration with financial services, we lifted the fee holds for 1,157 students so that they may be able to register for summer and or fall terms. Uh, that means uh, that was basically equated to or equivalent to about $1,143,247 that we are not receiving at this time. However, students are of course still expected to pay it, but we are not receiving it at this time. Next, the Madison College Foundation has dispersed approximately $1.3 million this fiscal year for scholarships and student support with more dollars being distributed in May, at the end of May and for the month of June. The foundation has also ex extended the scholarship deadline to June 14th. I sent out an email to all students on Tuesday. So I'm asking you and encouraging you to please, please, please take advantage of that opportunity. Last, I want to end with a shout out to everyone that helped facilitate our first virtual commencement. If you had an opportunity to uh, see it, uh, if you have not, please uh, still go on to uh, YouTube uh, to watch it. But understand there was a lot of hard work behind it. Student Life did an amazing job. Marketing did an amazing job. Uh, and those who also were part of the planning committee uh, just did an amazing job to present a quality product to you as students because you're deserving of it. And of course, to our Wolfpack family overall and to the community. With that, I end uh, my, uh, my interventions or my comments. And now on to the next. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, appreciate all that. Um, sharing those remarks and uh, scenarios from Madison College. Um, I'm going to move us over to the uh, question and answer portion of the meeting now. Um, I have a list of the uh, questions uh, in front of me that combine questions submitted ahead of time and those any of those that were asked in the chat. Um, we will do our best to get through all of these questions, um, but we are going to be concluding this portion by 6 p.m. to respect everyone's time. So um, uh, with that, I'm going to begin with our first question. Um, it, will student help positions at the college be available during the summer? And to that extent, uh, how about in the fall? I'm going to ask Rose if she, if she can answer that. Um, I'm here, and yes, I can answer that. Um, student helpers are um, will be paid over the summer if they have hours that um, you are assigning them or they are assigned and they can work, and also in the fall. Awesome. Um, next question is, if classes return in person, what will be done to encourage distan distancing or other safety measures? What equipment would the college provide? Mark? Um, so right now, as we've had some really minimal face-to-face -face spring completions come on campus, and you heard about that a little bit earlier, um, we're asking everyone to bring a face covering. And if they don't bring one, the college is providing a single-use disposable face covering at the door. Many of you are probably familiar with the precautions that we're taking with the electronic survey. So there's a self-diagnostic survey, and we've updated that as changes have come from public health entities to add a temperature check question just this week. And so we will continue to do that. And those same protocols we're presuming would be in place for any late summer face-to-face -face completion needs. As we plan for the fall and the potential of opening the campus up a little bit more, all that's gonna depend upon what the conditions are of the pandemic at the time. So things may be vastly improved. They may be the same as they are now. They may be worse. And so depending on what those conditions are, um, we'll have either physical barriers, um, such as if you go into the store, you may have seen plastic um, barriers put up between customer service counters. So anywhere where there would be close face-to-face -face interaction, we're looking at various options for doing that. We're looking at various classroom sizes and how we could arrange desks and chairs and computers for uh, maximizing the physical distancing uh, requirements that are in place now. So we have a team looking at those strategies. 
Um, and then we would, of course, if, if necessary, we would continue to have the facial coverings and the electronic survey means. It, it's all going to depend on what the conditions are late this summer as we make decisions about if and how to open up the campuses further. Um, but we have teams working, again, as sort of Dr. Casper's whole um, presentation on scenario planning. We have teams working on a variety of different scenarios of what we would need to do, but the college is very conscious of what the physical environment needs to be to keep everyone safe. Thank you. Um, there was a question asked, um, I've talked to several students and some, if the college does open uh, at any person for the fall, if you're uncomfortable returning to in-person classes, is there any talks of an optional online option similar to uh, what we have now for those who feel uncomfortable returning? Serena? Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, let me just say um, as a kind of a blanket thought on that question, Sean, um, our faculty are amazing in their willingness to work with students on an individual basis. Depend, I mean, they, they do that now. Um, and I think it's one of the things that really, really sets Madison College apart. Of course, that doesn't mean that, you know, we don't uh, challenge students to the max to meet the learning objectives, um, but their use of, um, you know, incomplete and independent study and um, those are all on the table to help mitigate um, student individual situations. Um, that said, as I mentioned earlier, some really good work is being done right now to uh, strategize on what what are the most innovative needed in delivery modes that we can uh, build into our course setup that will be as flexible as possible for students. One of them that we have now is called Flex Choice. Some of you might be familiar with that. It's essentially students have a choice. They can uh, pick one section either online or in a face-to-face -face format and go back and forth between the two. Uh, we're working on a couple of options around that type of setup for online live and online, synchronous and asynchronous. Um, and then any individual situation that would uh, be prohibited if there's a necessary face-to-face uh, -face component, uh, I would trust our faculty to address, to, to address that in a way that is in the student's best interest. Thank you. Um, next question we had, uh, if masks are required inside the building, will there be considerations for individuals that cannot wear masks due to ma medical conditions? Mark? So not a situation we've run into yet. Um, I think we'd want to talk with that individual. We do have two of our um, human protective services uh, faculty who are serving as COVID screening coordinators. And I would direct them to those individuals. And, and actually, if you've done the survey or if you've looked at that, it's the folks whose um, their contact information comes up in the midst of a survey. And that's who we're directing all those types of questions to. And so um, if someone has that, that question, a specific question about um, the conditions under which they can or cannot come back to campus, um, that email address or phone number is uh, right on the COVID uh, main page. It just says uh, COVID-19 screening coordinator and the link is in there. They can email um, or call them. Awesome, thank you. Um, next question here, uh, will Mass and College reduce the costs of credit hours or reduce student activity fees since students will not be using the buildings or attending school activities? Howard? Yes. Regarding that question, uh, tuition remains the same. However, we, we are reducing the student activity fee as well as eliminating the uh, commuter fee uh, for the summer and fall term. Awesome. Um, when will drop boxes for textbooks be available at campus locations? They are. Um, so drop boxes were just completed last week and um, they are available. Big black box very clearly says textbook rental. 
returned or being checked at any time. So folks can do that. Um, what you can also do is go on the main website and if you just search for bookstore, um, the bookstore will come up and there's also, uh, you can uh, sh ship your books back as well. So the address for where and how to do that, directions for that um, uh, are also on the website there. But uh, each of the campuses um, has one of those uh, big bins like a mailbox. Um, those all were installed as of uh, last week. Awesome. I'd like to add to that, uh, Sean. Thank you, Mark. Uh, they were installed two weeks ago at the regional campuses, so they're there. They're they're in place, and students are using them. Great. Um, next question we have in the uh, chat is: Which authoritative sources are being referred to when deciding what the conditions are for the college? That one. Um, so, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and then the college district is through 12 uh, separate counties. So we're monitoring each of those uh, 12 separate counties, public health departments um, and making our decisions based upon those, um, as well as uh, Department of Public Instruction, uh, the State Department of Public Instruction has additional guidance um, that we're following. And I, I wanna add to that, because when we get these directions and these changes from public health or from the state, we discuss them fully before we move forward with them. And then we make those decisions in line with what they're asking, but to ensure that we can do what they're asking. Thank you. Um, next question, when will the food pantries be uh, able to reopen to assist students in need? Um, so, as we're planning for fall, um, we're also looking at how we might be able to reopen the food pantries. Um, there's not a plan right now for them to be open in the summer. What we've done is we've donated all the food that we had, um, not just from the food pantries that we have on site, but also from our food service. Obviously, there's some inventory left behind. All that's been donated to local food pantries. Um, and so, there are some resources on the website um, for um, food insecurity, other resources, and where those uh, food pantries are, et cetera. There was a corollary question to that about food service uh, that I saw in the earlier questions. The same thing holds uh, for food service. As we're in this closed um, mode where we're, we're open remotely, but our facilities are mostly closed, um, we're planning for what that might look like in the fall. Uh, and you're going to hear us, and you've already heard us sort of saying the same things over and over again. It depends upon conditions. And so depending on how we allow folks to access the campuses in the fall, that'll dictate what kinds of food and beverage offerings we'll be able um, to provide. But again, the food service unit has been working over the last uh, couple months on multiple scenarios. And so there are plans for simply a grab and go, uh, everything from uh, just coffee and, and grab and go sandwiches up to what would it look like if the food service were fully open? We do think that food service being fully open will never look the same again. Um, so there are additional precautions that we'll have for um, salad bars and things like that. Um, so it'll look different, um, but there will be a new normal of what being fully open is. It just is gonna depend upon what those conditions are again, as we get into the late summer and decide what the fall term will actually look like. Thank you. Um, I just want to take a quick uh, second here and check in with anyone who is calling in uh, to ask any questions right now. I'll, I'll give a, uh, some time here, a few or like 10 seconds, uh, see if anyone has questions on it that's calling by phone. If not, I will continue on to the next question. Sounds uh, sounds good. Okay. Uh, will there be any? Uh, will there be some type of funding for international or non-citizen students who don't benefit from the Federal CARES Act funding? Howard. Students are. So the answer is that we have private funding through our Mass and College Foundation. So students are still asked to go through the CARES website. And there's a, a series of questions that they're asked. One may be, uh, are you eligible to apply? If you say no, then they provide you with a different direction. And then you complete that uh, application for uh, private funding through our Madison College Foundation. And then the process is the same as far as uh, the approval process. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, 
Could courses be taught via virtual rea reality uh, machines off campus? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I checked that out uh, with our CETL team because we have a real interest in virtual reality technology. We're experimenting with that for future growth. We've experimented with that as a course delivery means. Um, and while we'd love to offer that option on a broad basis, it's not possible at this time. Um, the VR headsets and the high powered laptops that you need to run the headsets are incredibly expensive. So we have a very limited inventory and uh, we don't want to exacerbate uh, any kind of digital equity issues um, at this time. So, um, like I said, we're continuing to monitor VR possibilities and, and options and experiment with it, but it's not available on a broad basis at this time. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, will it be clear when students register for classes whether their online courses will have required virtual meeting times? Uh, it was difficult to make it to the required virtual classes this semester while working. Yes, yes and yes. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things that we've heard from a lot of students and we know is critically important to you is when you make a choice of a course, when you register for a course, um, one, you need to make sure that the delivery mode works for you, your learning style and your life, when, you know, however possible. And we wanna, even in this remote world, give you some choices in terms of um, course delivery modes. And so we will be cleaning up those definitions and clarifying, for example, the difference between online live which has a required face-to-face -face component time, face-to-face -face on a screen, and online um, from an asynchronous perspective that's more open-ended. So we have heard that and understand why that's so critically important to you. And we will work then when we refine those definitions and tag them on to course setup, we'll work with marketing so that when you're registering, um, you'll be able to get definitions and understand the expectations of that delivery mode um, up front. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, has there been any further progress on the effect uh, credit nor credit courses will have on transfer agreements to four year universities? Tarina or Howard or myself? Yes, yes. In fact, just today, um, one of the things that um, both mine and Howard's statewide organizations have been working on uh, with the support of the President's Association is um, uh, an agreement for all WTCS credit, no credit, or pass fail to be guaranteed for transfer to all UW system schools. And we finally got that um, in writing today at like three o'clock. So it was great news and Bill, our registrar, has already updated the FAQs on the website. So as of a couple hours ago, um, we have that assurance. That's great. It really is. Um, it looks like next question. What are the online formats that the college will use to ensure safety and top notch visual slash audio learning counseling meetings and other online activity between the college and students? I think that Tarina and Howard are in the best position to answer this question. I can start. So regarding the technology, we typically use MS Teams and WebEx and as well as Jabber for telephone calls. Regarding technology, we also have taken into consideration privacy and FERPA protections. Thankful, uh, we're thankful to IT for helping us uh, with those, making sure there's FERPA and privacy protected as well. Um, and this is typical of most uh, colleges and universities. So students are able to use WebEx, and we're using that for advising. Students are able to use Microsoft Teams, we're using that for advising and counseling as well. And you have your job or telephone calls. Now I'm going to pass it over to. Uh, to really to speak to the format for uh, faculty uh, that faculty use for students. Thanks, Howard. Um, and Tim may have um, a chime in here too, but um, Howard said uh, 
Teams and WebEx, our college supported platforms. Uh, we have a team that is ensuring the most sophisticated use of our LMS and all its related features. I know that some of our faculty, even though the college doesn't support it on a, from a licensing perspective, a lot of faculty have, have found that Zoom is successful as well. And our CETL team, we have a, an academic technology team in, in CETL that's working with faculty and through professional development to make sure that, you know, the, the most reliable and efficient systems are, are uh, focused on. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that our technology services team continues to be aware of and participate in discussions around new threats, not just to Madison College, but to a lot of other entities. Because there was this massive switch to either learning remotely or working remotely. So we continue to be on top of that and work with the vendors that help support us with securing uh, the college's information systems and communication systems. Thank you. Um, our next question, um, going back to the activity fee question, can fees be changed without the approval of the student activities board? Uh, the board approved the summer commuter fee, but hasn't talked about fall as of now. As of as far as I know, my excuse me. Howard, if not, probably Tim. So the SAB did approve the, um, the uh, was it the commuter fee or the, um, I can't remember which fee, excuse me. SAB did help to approve one of them for the summer. And right now we're still going down that path if we don't have any students on campus for the fall. Thank you. Um, looks like our next question, how will the college and instructors meet the needs of students whose first language is not English if we proceed to online learning in the fall of 2020? Sabrina? Thank you. Um, great question. I really appreciate um, the thought behind this question because it's a really important one. And um, we have members of our CETL team, the Writing Center, our academic advancement faculty, and then we have something called um, the L2 Advisory Committee. This is a cross-disciplinary group of students and employees uh, recognize and support language identities on campus by providing resources that foster student social and academic success. Uh, those groups are working together um, as we speak to inform faculty about the affective challenges that uniquely impact multilingual students learning online and they're working with CETL to provide faculty ways to address those challenges. Work is important and ongoing. Thank you. Um, our next question, does Madison College have a plan in place to address a major COVID-19 outbreak in the future? Uh, Mark, and then I will add to it. Um, yeah, I think we're living it, frankly. Um, you know, we, as, as we got the first notions that this could become a pandemic and we're talking back in February before any of the shutdowns, um, we had a, a crisis scenario planning tabletop team about 20 folks across the college who sat down and said, well, you know, let's, let's do a crisis pandemic planning and let's use this COVID-19 thing we just heard about as a case study and let's pretend that that's the scenario. Um, and turns out here we are living the results of that planning. And so we were ahead of the game um, in that way. And now that we've been going through it for another 60, 90 days, we've learned so much more. And so we have a lot of communication channels, protocols for decision making, guidelines in place, et cetera, that certainly if, it, if it's a resurgence of COVID-19, um, Literally, I'm, you know, I'm not being sarcastic. We're living it right now. And the things that we dial up, we would dial back in terms of access and things like that. Um, and also, if it's any other kind of pandemic, not just the COVID pandemic, coronavirus pandemic, all that planning and the communications and response teams um, and a lot of the collaboration that's happened across the unit, depending upon our faculties, health expertise and emergency responder expertise, um, all those resources are still at the college, 
um, the benefit of the colleges, I think we're in a better position for any future pandemic because we've established the lines of communication and we've just lived through something like this. So, um, you know, on the one hand, I think we're living it now and we know how to react to this specific problem. Um, but I think we're really well positioned for any future ones uh, as well. I would echo what Mark just said very well, not just for a pandemic, but for any other event that causes a crisis. Uh, the communication we have with relationships and the collaborations. Uh, and we're memorializing so that these steps can so I feel quite comfortable if there's a spike, if there's another crisis, something else comes up, that we will be well positioned to address those as well. Thank you. Um, what is the best way to stay aware of changes in decisions over the summer? Kim, you want to take that? Sure, I can uh, address that. So as we came into this pandemic situation, we created a communications team. And so that planning work that Mark just referred to led to the creation of a standing committee that has representatives from marketing, employee communications, student affairs, and academic affairs, in addition to administrative services, Mark's area. And we meet twice a week to identify important messages that we need to communicate to all of you as students, as well as to the faculty and staff of the college. And when we're thinking about doing that, we're thinking about reaching you in multiple modalities, right? Because we realize that you're not tuned into just one source, right? So, you know, yes, email is an official college communication channel with students, but we're not relying only on that, right? We quickly rebuilt the website um, six, seven weeks ago, right, to help support you all as student learners, to keep you apprised of what was happening with the public health situation and how to access various resources that you needed to support yourselves, both as individuals as well as students at Madison College. Um, we're going to look for other modalities of reaching out to you through social media. Um, so if you follow me social media platform, whether it be Instagram, whether it be Facebook, um, Snapchat, those are places we're going to continue to produce content for you and your fellow students to uh, consume. Um, and we will, you know, probably continue to identify ways for us to get in front of this group, the student senate, and the other student leaders, so that you can hear directly from us as well. So again, multifaceted, covering the multiple issues that are important to each of you as students, as well as to our faculty and staff. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, I just want to check in uh, with everyone if there's any final comments that anyone wants to make or anyone that's on a phone call right now as that was we reached that final question uh, in the chat and uh, we're about to wrap up uh, the, this part of the meeting. So at this time, if anyone has anything to uh, add in, um, this would be the time to do it. Um, I'll give them a little bit here to do what they have to do if that's the case. All right, we've got one. Any news on the student organization budgets? I have no updates on the student organization budgets unless Mark has a specific update regarding those. I do not. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Then I believe at this time we're going to wrap up uh, this portion of the meeting. I would again like to thank Dr. Daniels uh, and, and the rest of the president cabinet members who uh, are attending tonight, um, as student leaders. Um, everyone and anyone from Madison College who wanted to take a part in being more informed with what's going on currently uh, in regards to Madison College. Um, I, uh, at this time, we're going to kind of um, move on to the uh, Student Senate General Assembly part of the meeting. Um, Sean, if I may. I'm going to kind of give a sec. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I, student Senate. across the college for this opportunity to have discussions. I 
think we all do, of having similar discussions uh, in the we learn a lot from them, but it's also good for you to get the information firsthand. So thank you very much and your team. And Ellie, thank you for hosting. Thank you, everyone. And I, I do appreciate that. Um, if anyone ha doesn't have anything else to say, um, yeah, we're going to move over to that uh, student senate part of the, um, the meeting. Um, other than that, I, I want to wish everyone a, a great rest of your evening. And um, I would like to...